fibrillation is a common scenario encountered in hospital practice. It has many important cross speciality implications and as such knowledge of the condition is vital in day to day practice. So let's begin with the definition of atrial fibrillation. Atrial meaning the atria and fibrillation meaning uncoordinated contractions of muscle fibers. So atrial fibrillation is an atrial arrhythmia characterized by rapid, chaotic, uncoordinated atrial activation. This negatively impacts atrial mechanical function. The normal functioning of the heart is therefore impaired. Risk factors and triggers of atrial fibrillation. Note that much of the etiology of atrial fibrillation is still shrouded in mystery, though there are several risk factors or triggers associated with the condition. Hemodynamic stress resulting in increased atrial pressure results in the remodeling of the atria and conditions such as tricuspid stenosis or pulmonary valve stenosis increase atrial pressure. Atrial ischemia is well studied in animal models to be associated with atrial fibrillation causing increased spontaneous atrial ectopic activity and slowing of atrial conduction leading to AF. More details on mechanisms are explained ahead. Inflammation is also associated with AF as is alcohol consumption, um, holiday heart syndrome, abnormal heart rhythms following excessive alcohol consumption. Endocrine disorders, notably um, diabetes, has a well-documented association with AF. Left ventricular hypertrophy in isolation also has a um, association with AF and interestingly analysis of the Farmington study suggests um, that um, Left ventricular mass increased with the worsening of glucose tolerance and the trend was more striking in women than in men. Increasing age, neurological disorders and genetic factors are all associated with the condition. So, there are two main theories regarding the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation. The risk factors of atrial fibrillation described before cause stress to the atrium. This stress induces a change in atrial tissue atrial tissue heterogeneity where the cells display different properties namely altered conduction and refractory properties now this results in the loss of one wave front the p wave on the ecg that causes a normal depolarization and causes several smaller wave fronts to develop the fibrillation waves this theory is known as the multiple wavelet theory the second theory is the automatic focus theory. The idea behind this is that a single site initiates atrial fibrillation by rapidly firing signals that overtake the SA node. The source for this focus might be myogenic areas in the pulmonary vein. In this case, the risk factors promote the development and initiation of the automatic focus. Why is atrial fibrillation such a problem? It causes atria dysfunction. The atria cannot pump blood into the ventricles as effectively. An analogy, lots of people squeezing a bottle of ketchup lightly at different points, not in unison, results in very little ketchup on a plate of fish and chips, for example. Aside to the mechanical dysfunction, blood remains in the atria unable to be pumped out, resulting in stasis. Stasis is one of Virchow's triad, which describes factors contributing to thrombosis. This stasis leads to clot formation. These clots spread and occlude blood vessels, resulting in stroke. The longer this goes on for, the greater the risk for systemic emboli. Here is an ECG strip showing AF. The heart rate is irregular as you can see the distance between the R waves and note the lack of a clear P wave. And instead you have multiple fibrillation waves. Moving on to the types of atrial fibrillation, there are four acute, paroxysmal, persistent and permanent. Other descriptions of atrial fibrillation include fast AF with a ventricular rate above 100 and slow AF with a ventricular rate less than 60 beats per minute. So acute atrial fibrillation is usually precipitated by acute illness and this usually resolves once the hypoxia and electrolyte abnormalities are corrected, resolving in fif within 50% of patients in two days and those in whom the acute AF is not corrected requiring further intervention. If the patient is not stable, hemodynamically compromised, give emergency electrical cardioversion regardless of 
AF duration, we do not wait for it to resolve by itself. Why does the duration matter? The greater the AF goes on for, the more likelihood of clot development. In a stable patient, also, um, electrical cardioversion is recommended, and if there is a delay, give IV amiodarone. Paroxysmal AF is defined as self-terminating episodes lasting less than 7 days. Patients can be asymptomatic, but those with symptoms manifest with shortness of breath, fatigue and generalized weakness. Paroxysmal AF can translate into permanent AF with this risk increased with time. This may be due to the electrical, contractile and structural atrial remodeling. With well tolerated attacks, no treatment is required. However, uh, if these attacks are more troublesome, beta blockers can be prescribed such as metro uh, metropolol to reduce ectopic firing aiming to restore sinus rhythm or flaconide or amiodarone can be used. Those patients who have no structural heart disease can undergo catheter ablation. More on algorithms ahead. Persistent atrial fibrillation is defined as episodes that last more than seven days with options of both chemical and electrical cardioversion on the table. Long persistent AF is described as AF that lasts over one year with the decision to pursue rhythm control that is to restore sinus rhythm via cardioversion, pharmacological agents, 1A, 1C and 3 or non-pharmacological options such as catheter ablation, pacing or surgery. Permanent AF in comparison is when the decision not to follow rhythm control for whatever reason and instead long term weight control is adopted. So moving on to the management of atrial fibrillation. I've just gone over specific treatments for the different types of AF. In the following slides we'll go over management options in detail. When it comes to AF there are four main principles, stroke prevention, weight control, rhythm control and improvement of cardiovascular outcomes. Let's start off by mentioning the scores that we use to help us manage the condition. Chad's VASC calculates risk for stroke in atrial fibrillation. Has bled scores permit us to calculate risk for major bleeding with AF on anticoagulation, useful when prescribing anticoagulation. The next slide illustrates the sc scoring system used in Chad's VASC. Having congestive heart failure scores you 1 point, hypertension scores you 1 point, age greater than 75 gives you 2 points and age between 65 to 74 scores you 1 point. D is for diabetes, S is for stroke or TIA, V is for vascular disease and being female scores you an automatic 1 point. If a patient scores 0, no treatment needs to be done. A score of 1 in males means that anticoagula anticoagulation should be considered and a score of 2 or more patient needs anticoagulation. If a patient requires anticoagulation, we can then go ahead and assess the risk using has bled. H is for hypertension with, um, scoring 1 point. Uh, it takes in... It, um, it also takes into account abnormal liver and kidney functions, both one point each. Stroke gets you a score of one and incidence of major bleeding or a predisposition such as a hemophilia also gives you points. L is for an unstable fluctuating INR, label N I N R. E is for elderly and those with and um, those above fifty years scoring a point. D is for drug or alcohol use equal to or greater than eight drinks a week. A medication usage predisposing to bleeding such as antiplatelet agents and NSAIDs also score you a point. <clears throat> so, 0 to 2 indicates a low risk for bleeding, 3 or greater high risk for bleeding. Okay, now the management for stroke pre um, prevention. Pharmacological modalities in stroke prevention include warfarin, thrombin inhibitors, aspirin, and clopidogrel. Non-pharmacological techniques include the removal or isolation of the left atrial appendage. However, the, however, the effectiveness, effectiveness of this procedure is controversial. Here is the left atrial appendage. Um, it's a site for clot development. Sealing this off um, is thought to reduce the incidence of clot formation. <coughs> Okay, rate control. A rate control strategy accepts the presence or occurrence of AF and aims to control ventricular rate and the degree of irregularity despite continuing fibrillation within the atria. 
This is again split into pharmacological um, modalities such as calcium blockers, vapamil, deltaism, beta blockers such as metropolol and digitalis. <coughs> non pharmacological um, techniques include ablation and pacing. Okay, rhythm control on the other hand attempts to restore and maintain sinus rhythm. This can involve cardioversion, described in more detail on the next slide, or pharmacological interventions with class A, 1A, 1C, and free drugs. Non pharmacological interventions include catheter ablation, pacing, and surgery. The main surgery aims to carve a pathway for atrial conduction by cauterization, preventing fibrillation. So with DCC, um, it's important for the patient to be anticoagulated three weeks prior to the procedure and three to four weeks after due to the risk of systemic embolism as described before. The procedure carries a risk for a stroke and this can be assessed via the use of a transesophageal echocardiography where we can see if clots have formed. So here is uh, echo image of a thrombus in the right atrium of a critically ill patient in compensated shock. A useful point to understand is that the aim of pharmacological therapy, pharmacological therapy uh, such as class 1A, 1C and 3 drugs in rhythm control is to prolong the action potential. <clears throat> The general idea of a delayed action potential is bringing more irregular firing cells into the desired main collective, similar to like uh, similar to a school bus waiting longer for those late students. Okay, improving cardiovascular outcomes. What can we do to prevent essentially stroke? and complications of AF. Well, the use of jonanidron, this is a new agent um, thought to be more safer than amiodarone and um, consumption of omega-3 fish oils, um, it's still debatable. However, moving on, uh, now that we have gone over weight and rhythm control, we have to decide um, how do we exactly decide which, um, which should we use in the patient. So with new onset AF, we first determine the type of AF, which will influence the management. Prior to this, if a patient is unstable, unstable we give them electrical cardioversion uh, as required. So um, step two, step one is determining the type of atrial fibrillation. Step two is correcting the underlying causes of AF, such as hypertension, hyperthyroidism, etc. Moving on to step three, we look at the complete clinical picture of the patient and depending upon this, we determine whether to rate or rhythm control. Factors favoring rate control include having persistent AF being less symptomatic and being greater than 65 years of age. Also failure of antirhythmic drug administration. Factors favoring rhythm control include paroxysmal or newly detected AF, patient being more symptomatic, age below 65, no hypertension, heart failure exacerbated by atrial fibrillation, i.e. an unstable patient where electrical cardioversion is due, and no previous failure of antirhythmic drugs. After the decision to undergo either weight or rhythm control, we can move on to selecting the appropriate pharmacologic, pharmacological agents. This is after we have deemed whether or not electrical cardioversion will be used in rhythm control, for example, in an acutely unwell, unstable patient, as mentioned before. So here is a weight control drug al algorithm in which we target a heart rate below 100. We use beta blockers such as metropolol across the board, switching to bisoprolol oral as needed. This is a common method uh, used in um, real life practice for weight control. Additional calcium channel combination drugs can be used and as can digoxin if a patient has no heart disease or hypertension. Patients with no heart disease and CAD can undergo therapy using jonanidron if required. Here is a rhythm control drug algorithm. 
and this is um, based on left ventricular function with normal left ventricular um, um, functioning patients using dronenandron, fleconide, propafenone and sotalone. Failure to resolve involves use of amiodarone followed by catheter ablation. With abnormal left ventricular function, if the ejection fraction is above 35%, amiodarone, dronenandron and sotalone are indicated. Below 35%, we would jump straight to amiodarone and this is succeeded by catheter ablation. So here are the references that I've used in this presentation. Just like to say thanks again guys for watching. If you do have any questions, please do leave them in the comment section below. I will try my best to get back to you. Any suggestions for topics that you want covered, please also leave a comment below. Thanks again for watching.